is going to take more than an election cycle. You know, the deep structural things that we're trying to change will probably take a generation, really, you know, if we're really going to succeed in changing what we really want. And so I hope that this is a beginning of a long relationship with both Larry and Mark. They worked together. They founded uh, Fix Congress first, and, and they're going to co-chair the Mock Constitutional Convention. Um, and I'm, I'm thrilled that they're here. So thank you so much. Okay. Welcome to the Hope and Crosby Tour. Thanks a lot. Uh, I, I talked a little bit about this yesterday. We did, and uh, this is something I've been passionate about for a long time. It was one of my initial attractions to John McCain. Uh, but this is fundamentally, at the end of the day, all about trust and a broken trust. And uh, I've seen this from the inside. I've seen it from the outside. I've seen it from a campaign's point of view. I've seen it from elected officials' point of view. Uh, and it's really discouraging uh, to work for noble public servants who go into office and want to do the people's business and they discover before day one, I mean they discover during the campaigns, but then most of them who are new to the process are shocked to discover that they have to spend almost all their time in public service raising money to stay there. Now imagine if you had to do that for your job. You know, imagine if you spent 90% of your time, say 75, say 50, percent of your time raising money to stay in the job that you're in. It's perverted. Uh, not to mention, so it, it, has, uh, it has a debilitating impact on the public servants and therefore the consequences are that good people don't get in and good people who are in get out. And that's hop and I've seen dozens and dozens of people that I've worked for and others just leave public office because, because of the, the corrupting influence of money. So, uh, not to mention the people's perceptions about it. And, and that's all about feeling uh, completely unable, incapable uh, to impact the process because of the perception and the reality that money has completely taken over the process. And therefore, if moneyed interests control the process, how can I as an individual have any impact? But you can, and, and we've got some great ideas. David Donnelly talked about some, some really significant legislation that's happening that we're very excited about for a lot of reasons. I think that uh, uh, it's going to get on the radar screen in a big way, and because of Citizens United, uh, that uh, the American public's going to wake up, and that uh, the, the legislative body's going to wake up, Republicans are going to wake up, Democrats are going to wake up, and we've got a real opportunity to change the system. And we can see how. Fundamentally, I mean, Republicans, uh, uh, politicians, and elected officials' antenna are quivering right now because they see what's happening with the Tea Party. They see what's happening here. They know that something's happening in America, and they've got to do something about it, or they're going to be looking for a new job. So uh, the time is ripe right now. So uh, the people are the fountain of all power. That's what James Madison argued at the Constitutional Convention in 1987. But fast forward to today, the power of the people has been perverted. Corporations and labor unions, industry groups, and single issue organizations spend billions of dollars each year to gain access to decision makers in DC. How, how insignificant is the power of the people when money rather than votes influences how legislation is written and how this country is governed? The job of elected leaders is to deliver results that represent the interests of citizens who place them in a position of authority with their vote. But it's a mad, mad merry-go-round where Congress endlessly chases campaign cash and voters can't even get a ticket for the ride. They've been sold out to lobbyists and special interests. Lobbyists represent clients and special interests to politicians and government regulators. Lobbyists fund galas and golf outings and grand events. They contribute cash to campaigns. And any multi-million dollar no-bid contract then awarded to the clients of those lobbyists is all, well, just coincidental. In many cases, lobbyists even serve as an extension of a congressional office staff, helping to actually craft the legislative language to favor the client. And it's legal. That's the scandal. So strong is the siren call of campaign cash from lobbyists, elected, rep uh, elected representatives willingly throw themselves on the rocks of moral destruction. After being rejected by the voters in Alaska's primary election last month, the incumbent Republican Senator Lisa Murkowski has now decided to run as a write-in candidate. 
But hours before making this announcement to the voters, her campaign staff first sent out an email to lobbyists asking for their support. D.C. Representative Eleanor Holmes Norton was recently caught leaving a voicemail soliciting funds from a lobbying firm. In that call, she cites her previous work in the industry sector. She also mentions her control of stimulus funds for the district. It's not illegal for her to solicit funds. It is illegal if she uses the power of her office to make promises or threats of action or inaction based on campaign cash. Now, whether it's on behalf of climate advocates or the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, lobbying itself is legal. As government grows, lobbying grows. Unless you're right there to fight it, to limit it, government can intrude on just about any industry. And that's why big business and big labor fight back. Corporations and unions are barred from donating to federal election campaigns. They may not contribute directly to federal PACs, but their employees and members can. On the other hand, donations by lobbying firms to office holders are allowed, though regulated and limited, the line is frequently crossed. A federal grand jury last week charged the lobbyists with close ties to Senator uh, uh, Congressman John Murtha with 11 counts of evading federal limits on campaign donations by using straw donors to illegally funnel hundreds of thousands of dollars to members of Congress. With all the other recent ethical scandals and investigations sur surrounding Governor Blagojevich, Congressman Rangel, Senator John Ensign, and be honest, no wonder people feel powerless. The once shining city on the hill looks more like the swamp that it originally was. In the real world outside the Beltway, paying for a relationship is generally frowned upon. It's illegal in all states but Nevada. <laughs> Think about it. <laughs> the relationship between lobbyists on K Street and the powers that be in D.C. goes beyond dating for dollars. It's incestuous. There's a well-greased revolving door, and it's not lower mid-level staffers. It goes all the way to the top. Secretary of, of HHS Kathleen Sebelius was a chief lobbyist for the Trial Lawyers Association. Leon Panetta, head of the CIA, was director of a lobbying firm. And to be fair, it's also uh, the Republicans. Trent Lott, former majority leader for the Republicans, now a lobbyist. You, you, think donors, you think doors don't open easily for him at the Senate office buildings for a former Senate, for Republican leader? Of course they do. With all the debate this year about health care and tort reform, it shouldn't surprise you that the top industries giving to members of Congress this year were law firms and the health care industry. And 81 percent of the millions in funding from law firms this cycle went to Democrats. Of course, that's already changing with the prospect of a Republican House leader. Hedging their bets, the health care industry split their millions a bit more evenly, 58 percent to Democrats, 42 percent to Republicans. And the top recipient of those two industry groups was Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid. And though the Democrats have tried to paint uh, John Boehner as the lobbying king, Senator Lincoln, Senator Schumer, uh, and, and Senator Schumer each pocketed more in lobbyist cash in the last 18 months than Boehner did in the last six election cycles. Just shows you what happens when your party's in power. Big industry and big business are not bad. I want to be clear, big business is not bad business. Businesses create jobs, including mine. It generates wealth for pensions and retirement funds. And it drives the economy forward by providing products people want to buy. Businesses and industries should have a voice, but it shouldn't be a voice bigger than the people who are voting and being represented. That's really what it's all about at the end of the day. But big money becomes a big amplifier, and the biggest givers are not always big business. Some of the biggest individual campaign donors uh, are bundlers who are now serving as ambassadors. I've seen this from the inside. I mean, you look at any president who gets elected and look around at who gets to the ambassadorships, guess what? They're the biggest donors. I'm going to uh, uh, just tell you a quick story. When I was in Texas, uh, I worked for a governor years ago in the 80s. And in Texas today, as it was then, there are no campaign limitations. You can give a candidate for governor a million dollars. And so the, uh, the person who was the sort of the field organizer for that governor, not surprisingly, when he got elected, became the appointments director, right? And, uh, so he was meeting with his counterpart from Wisconsin, talking about the appointments process. And Wisconsin, as you may know, has, a, has very strict campaign finance regulations. I, I don't know what they are today, but you probably can't give more than $500 to somebody running for governor. And he related this to the guy from Texas. And the guy from Texas said, wait a minute, so you can't give more than $500 to somebody running for governor? And the guy from Wisconsin said, yeah, that's right. And the guy from Texas kind of thought for a second, looked at him and said, well, so how do you know who to appoint? <laughs> uh, 
Uh, when ta uh, money itself is not the root of all evil. Just like you, I like making it. Uh, but the love of power it brings is. Uh, and this should have been one of the lessons learned from the meltdown in 2008. The country is not too big to fail. Our political and economic systems are fatally intertwined. The powers of public government and private corporations have been fused. Risk is offloaded to us while a select few determine who wins, who loses, and who pays. And we know who pays. We do. Look, look what happened. Because there's no such thing as government funding. It's taxpayer funding. In 2008, the New Yorker said, President Obama offers himself as a catalyst by which disenchanted Americans can overcome two decades of vicious partisanship, energize our democracy, and restore faith in government. Well, that hasn't happened. Congress now ranks 16th among public institutions when it comes to trust behind big business and even the media. It all points to a broken trust. It's not a Democratic issue. It's not a Republican issue. It's really a, com a communicable D.C. issue. During the Deepwater Horizon, uh, Deep Horizon oil spill, we learned that DP has donated $3.5 million to federal candidates over the last 20 years. The largest chunk of those dollars went to President Obama. No wonder people are frustrated. Their voices are no longer being heard. They're being drowned out by the more powerful, gushing sound of money. The angry town hall meetings last summer and the rise of the Tea Party movement should not be a surprise. This gathering should not be a surprise. And some of my friends deride the Tea Party movement as some sort of ma manufactured event the media does. They shouldn't. It's real. This is real. Populist movements arise in times of economic hardship and uncertainty, and they may take root on the right or the left, but this time the revolt is widespread. From the left and the right, citizens recognize that our democracy does not work when the power of the people is perverted. And that's why you're here today, to make your voices heard. Reform of any kind has been stalled by the status quo. The forces that profit are blocking change, and neither side in the political debate benefits from this inertia. Fair elections is not a Democratic issue or a Republican issue, and the Republicans would be foolish to cede it to the Democrats. It's an American issue. It's where we come together as a country. The midterm elections are making it clear. If Washington does not change its ways, then the voters will change Washington. Earlier this year, Florida became the latest state to invoke Article 5 of the Constitution, calling for a constitutional convention to restore some of the checks and balances that Washington is, is ignoring. And that's why we're meeting here today. And if legislators refuse to respond to the people with legislation to fix the problem, then the people can go over their head through state constitutional conventions to restore sanity to a system that's broken. And if 34 states pass a resolution calling for a convention, then all sides will have the opportunity to argue for the changes they believe will restore our democracy. A constitutional convention will last well beyond one or two election cycles. The very length of the convention and ratification process gives, will give the people a stronger voice. Any amendment proposed must be ratified by 38 states to become law. We, require, we would require that the delegates to the convention include neither current nor future politicians. While there's no guarantee a constitutional convention will result in campaign finance reform amendment, if we're going to fix Washington, we've got to lead the charge. There are 100 senators and 435 representatives but there are over 310 million of us. The beauty of a convention is that all comers are welcome and all issues can be debated, not just fair elections, but all the important issues that our representatives have refused to act on because they're hostages to the system. When the Tea Party realizes after November that their agenda is once again being ignored, the idea will begin to pick up steam with the Tea Party, I'm sure. The only way to repair a broken trust is to show the people, real people, that we can once again have an impact on the system. And if the system won't allow for change, then we'll just have to change the system. We've done it before. We'll just have to demonstrate that once again, we the people have the real power. Thank you.